In my view, there is no greater honor than to be remembered by the epithet The Great. It is a club which includes only the most influential, the ambitious, and the bravest of men. While there may be nothing stopping me from calling my dog James the Great, or even myself the Great, to become a part of this elite club requires centuries of sustained use. In other words, the epithet only really matters if it sticks. Henry VIII, for example, was referred to as the Great until the end of the Tudor rule. After that, well, there is a reason there has not been another King Henry in England. Frederick II, King in Prussia, however, has kept this title for long enough to safely say that it has stuck. He is arguably the only German ruler who is consistently referred to as the Great. Through military victories, enlightened reforms, and territorial expansion, Frederick became one of the most celebrated kings in both German and world history. But this celebrated history came tantalizingly close to never occurring. I have come to believe that the road to greatness is paved by the bodies of countless men whose quest for greatness destroyed them. What if I told you that Frederick the Great came within a few hairs of that miserable fate? His entire reputation, his legacy, was saved by an unexpected death. That if it weren't for this miraculous event, the second miracle of the House of Brandenburg, Frederick and his state would be nothing. Let's take a step back for a second. This video is not intended to be a summary of Frederick the Great's life and achievements, but it is important to have some context to better understand the second miracle of the House of Brandenburg. The miracle came in 1762 at the tail end of the Seven Years' War, which summarized in a few words was a sort of proto-World War. Prussia's predicament, however, was much more regionalized. In the prelude to the war, Frederick had seized resource-rich Silesia from the Austrians. Fast forward 16 years and one half-hearted attempt by Austria to reclaim Silesia, and the grudge between these two German states was unhealed. Ironically, the escalation for this war came when Britain, which would become Prussia's ally, offered to bribe Russia in order to put troops on the Prussian border. Frederick reacted to this by signing an Anglo-Prussian agreement which angered both France, Prussia's traditional ally, and Russia, which subsequently saw its own deal with Britain dropped. The cards were now in place for a war that would see Prussia fight all three great powers, Austria, Russia, and France. Undoubtedly, this was the greatest military crisis for the House of Brandenburg since the Thirty Years' War. In this period of crisis, Frederick proved his mettle as a tactician and strategic thinker. The war may not have been a consecutive string of Prussian victories, but it is certainly fair to say that the Prussian army performed exceptionally given the odds. However, even the greatest of us are limited by our resources, and Frederick was no exception. With each passing month, the war developed into one of attrition, a type of war favorable to the populous Russian and Austrian states. By late 1761, Russian forces were threatening Berlin, and Prussian losses were mounting. The situation was dire.
Finally, we are back to where we started. Frederick may have proven himself an effective wartime king, but he was facing defeat. Without hindsight, it is easy to see that Frederick was in an impossible situation. For Frederick, defeat would mean losing everything. In territorial terms, Silesia was to be returned to Austria and East Prussia ceded to Russia. Prussia, already much smaller than the other great powers, would be irrecoverably diminished. However, the losses to his state would run far deeper than territory. Not just the territorial gains of his reign, but the military tradition of his father and the international prestige of his grandfather. The whole history of the House of Brandenburg squandered in an impossible war. His legacy would be akin to Charles XII, a man who lost everything in the blind pursuit of greatness. If you don't know the end of this story, you're probably wondering how the timing of one death reversed Frederick's fortunes so drastically. The unfortunate soul whose death became celebrated as a miracle was Elizabeth, Empress of Russia. Just as her timely death ensured Frederick's legacy, it ruined hers. When Elizabeth breathed her last breath, Russia was on the brink of victory. It had occupied the whole of East Prussia and threatened Berlin with imminent capture. Maybe she would not get all the credit for the war she had waged, but she could die happy knowing that she had left her heir with an easy victory. Unfortunately for Elizabeth, she had never considered the possibility that her successor may not have wanted to win. Without any children of her own, Elizabeth had named her nephew, Peter, as heir of the Russian Empire. Peter, now Peter III of Russia, had always been an admirer of Frederick II. However, when he became emperor, the truly absurd extent of his admiration was revealed. The man literally dressed just like Frederick, followed his every trend, and even went so far as to call the Prussian my master. Therefore, placating the new emperor was surprisingly easy. In a series of corresponding letters, Frederick pledged his undying friendship and praised Peter's truly German heart. When he learned that Peter obsessed over the decoration of the Black Eagle, the highest chivalric order in Prussia, he quickly inducted Peter and sent him the decoration. With the new Russian emperor suitably appeased, Frederick finally began the delicate work of peace. Frederick's correspondence succeeded with flying colors. Peter showed no loyalty to his new empire whatsoever. When peace was established on May 15, 1762, it leaned heavily in Prussian favor. Despite occupying a large chunk of Prussia, no territories were to be annexed by Russia. Further, on June 1st, Russia agreed to switch sides, albeit in a lesser role, pledging 20,000 men in the war against Austria. I can't stress how insane this settlement was. Russia was winning the war. It had lost over 100,000 men against the Prussians and had serious strategic and economic interests in acquiring the port of Königsberg. After all of that, nothing? Really? There is certainly no scarcity of bad rulers, but I think Peter is in a league of his own. Getting back to Frederick, 
who at the beginning of 1762 had been in a position of imminent defeat, was now in a position of strength. He still had the Austrians to deal with, but we all know how well the Austrians tend to fare against the Prussians. In effect, the second miracle of the House of Brandenburg had saved Frederick and his state from utter ruin. I think there's a lesson to be learned in this absurd story. Our struggles may not be as monumental as Frederick's, but the same principles apply to our own lives. For those who don't believe in fate or miracles, the only option is to turn towards the chaos of chance. How many people almost earned that coveted epithet, the great, only to be rebuked due to an unexpected change in circumstances? Frederick would not be any less gifted as a leader if the miracle never occurred, but he certainly would be perceived so. The man who elevated Prussia to unseen greatness could just have easily been the harbinger of its demise. This same principle can be applied to anyone who ever has dealt with chance. How much of our opinions of others, or even ourselves, come from chance. Maybe you are not a loser for not getting a call back from that job interview. It could be that the guy they interviewed after you happened to be in the same fraternity as the interviewer. Did that girl you finally built up the courage to ask out reject you? Maybe you really did ask at a bad time. This analogy, however, goes both ways. The fact that we can't control the world around us makes what we can control that much more important. The Fredericks of the world may often be brought to failure by chance, but the Peters of the world achieve failure without the aid of chance.